Welcome to uh, the CIBS Executive Lunch. Today, we are talking with Alberto Cavaglioni, former head of China for Maserati, former head of Alfa Romeo EMEA, and currently VP for North America for Palfinger. Alberto, thank you very much to be here with us today. My first question for you is about your career. You have had a long, successful career with luxury and premium brands. Please uh, briefly introduce how China fits into your career development. Well, this is a, a very interesting uh, story. I, I think we need to go uh, back a few years uh, when I joined uh, uh, the CNH uh, Industrial Group back in 2012, where I was uh, responsible for marketing for Iveco. Uh, and already Iveco, the truck uh, company for uh, the group, uh, had a uh, strong business with Naveco uh, in China. And uh, after Iveco, I uh, moved uh, into the automobile part uh, of the group, uh, joining Alfa Romeo, where I was responsible for product, for sales. Uh, and there I had the uh, amazing opportunity to be part of the group that uh, launched uh, uh, the Alfa Romeo 4C, that was uh, a very uh, it's a special car that told us that the brand was still very strong. And we also worked on the launch of, uh, or better, the relaunch of the Alfa Romeo brand. And one of the pillars of this relaunch uh, was to bring uh, uh, Alfa Romeo uh, into China. So we have been working with the local people to see how we could bring uh, uh, this brand to China. After Alfa Romeo, as you mentioned, I also worked uh, in Maserati. And for Maserati, what uh, uh, we had experienced is that this brand was uh, very loved uh, in China, very loved in uh, Asia, and um, China really was uh, and became our most important market uh, for, for the brand. And um, after having managed uh, uh, the global sales operation uh, for Maserati, I was given the tremendous opportunity to come and run the business uh, uh, in China for Maserati. So, before, let's say, I was uh, seeing how numbers were for Maserati in China, and then I had uh, the privilege, as you do remember, because we met back then uh, to run the business in this uh, in this country. So, w when you compare all these uh, markets, all these countries, what are the uh, major learning points that you got from that experience? Well, again, I, I like to go back, uh, you know, to, to to my roots, if you want. Uh, but what I did previously uh, in my let's say, working experience was always uh, to travel. So I had the luxury to um, visit different countries, to learn different languages, English as we do now, French, Spanish uh, and German. So to me, it's very important is not to come into a country, come into a new culture with uh, something that uh, you believe is absolutely right. You need to listen. You need to understand the people. You need to adapt yourself. If you want like a tailor-made uh, suit, uh, and uh, this uh, will help you to really get to learn the people, get to learn the habits, get to learn how to do business. And this is always what uh, what I did. I have to say that uh, the effect of being open-minded came from, uh, again, a business experience that uh, I was given at the really beginning of my career when working for Sango Bank, where I had the chance to uh, live in the UK, live in France, uh, Spain, and uh, I was at the time also responsible for a little product line that uh, was sold uh, uh, outside Europe, and I was responsible for this geographical area, so being the Middle East, being Africa, being South America, being Asia. So the opportunity really to uh, continuously uh, travel, to meet different people, to ask questions, I think this is the way people should approach uh, uh, a new in your adventure, you know, when you are given the opportunity that I believe more than an opportunity is a present that uh, an organization gives uh, to um, his uh, uh, employees uh, in uh, having the chance uh, to uh, visit work uh, uh, a country that is not your own. I, I remember in the one conversation we had uh, last year that uh, the first time you have a meeting with your employees uh, you were surprised to have uh, people using the phone during the meeting. Can you tell us the, the story? I think it was very interesting. Well, you know, I was teached, I would say, 
that uh, when you attend meetings, you really put away your phone, uh, you close your laptop because uh, it's a matter of respect towards the people uh, you are listening, towards your colleagues. And when I came to China, it was not for me the first time uh, that I came to China. I was uh, in China back in 2005, 6, 7, so for a number of years. But let's say when you really run a business, when you really run you know, uh, a local team, for me, that was the first experience. I saw people, you know, uh, using the phone and I felt a little bit uh, uncomfortable because this was really not my style and I felt that they were not interested in what I was saying. The reality was that they were simply, you know, checking things while we were doing things. So it was uh, a complete different way of uh, doing business. And then after the meeting, they told me, don't worry, people were really paying attention. People maybe were taking notes, were checking already what you were asking for. It was a good uh, cultural, uh, I'll say, shock, if you want, but um, I learned that very quickly. The other thing that I learned very quickly, I do remember something that I thought was important, that was always to speak up. You know, even though sometimes uh, in China, I found the people a little bit more shy, if you want, and uh, uh, they were listening much more than uh, what they were expressing their own ideas. I really asked uh, to express their opinion to disagree with what I was telling because they were, of course, much more knowledgeable than what I was at the time and that uh, I am today. But for me, it was important also to hear their voice, to hear their different viewpoints uh, and to learn, uh, you know, how they saw the uh, project that we were putting together, you know, because you still have time when you do a project to change it till the moment, you know, the project leaves the room and goes to the market. There is too late. And your Chinese team was able to adapt to your leadership style or it took some time? I can tell you, I do remember very well the first meeting and the last meeting, okay, the business ones. And I could see the level of interaction was uh, much higher. It, it is something uh, what you learn, you know, and uh, how the human being adapts uh, to the different cultures as long as you are open to listen, because this is, again, something that I learned a lot in China. You need to listen because you understand much more when you listen rather than uh, when you talk over people. Okay? And uh, being a Latin uh, person by, by nature, you know, being Italian, uh, it has been for me, uh, for me a challenge. But if you think uh, what I'm doing currently, working for an Austrian-based company, you know, I'm also today learning a different type of approach where people don't talk too much, you know, where people are very process driven. I think that throughout the different uh, periods of your career, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, where you do it, how you do it, you always learn something. And uh, it is uh, to me very important to understand that one single individual will never change an organization because you have the culture that is, uh, you know, the most important foundation that an organization has, but you can influence that culture. So you can bring your contribution thanks to the experience that you have. You know, in a room, there are always many brains and uh, the sum of these brains is by definition and for sure, you know, a better brain than uh, the brain of the box. You, you have a very impressive international career, so many different countries. Uh, you think that in today's world, it's important to build an international career to reach the highest level in the organizations of a multinational? You know, I started many, many, many years ago when I was in high school uh, because uh, I had the chance, thanks to um, what uh, my father was doing, you know, to travel a little bit. Uh, and uh, I started to have friends that didn't live in Italy. So it became a sort of need for me, you know, to, to learn and to, and to exploit this interest towards language. And then luckily I had a family that allowed me to travel during the summer uh, and uh, I started to find some, uh, let's say, summer works, you know. Uh, so I've been uh, traveling to make a little bit of money and this became uh, a sort of, as I said, uh, a sort of need. You know, I really need to be in contact with people that are different. Uh, th these to me are opportunities to enrich uh, your own soul. And this is the personal, if you want, aspect. At the same time, nowadays, there are, uh, you know, I would say mainly global and or local companies, and therefore you need to know how to work uh, in a multicultural environment with different nationalities. Uh, this is a tremendous added value, and the added value is, as I said before, that also in a business environment, uh, 
the more you have different people, different ideas, different way of being, the better the organization will be, the better and the faster the organization will be able to adapt to the different business environment. Because even if you sell a global product, then you need to adapt your style in the country to which you work. This is a matter of cultural respect and is a matter of understanding what the people that you're selling to that are the customers that by definition we always say that the customer is king want. So if they want something, you need to give it to them, but you need to be capable to understand how they want it. And you think that uh, multinationals organization uh, have people, talent with that mindset, global mindset, or is not enough? More and more, yes. Um, even though I have to say that uh, I see uh, new generations that uh, are very local because uh, you know they use uh, these uh, digital tools that are available. I am still probably, even though I feel very young, uh, the old uh, style type of guy. I believe that it's important to meet the people. I believe that it's important to understand the body language. I really believe that you need to meld with the culture. You know, it's not sufficient only to interact uh, via you know, the digital uh, tools that are available today. So I think that people, maybe today, they're a little bit arrogant in believing that because they have seen everything on, uh, on, uh, on the digital platforms that are available, they know what. I believe that uh, what you experience digitally and what you experience physically being there You know, it's a complete different type uh, of, uh, of experience uh, because you also suffer. Uh, I can tell you, I have been suffering a lot in learning cultures, you know, because uh, you feel, ah, this is not me, uh, this is not what I like. And then, uh, you know, it, day after day becomes better. And then what you thought at the beginning that was a limitation, you know, it becomes a strength and you love it even more. So to ask to your organization to Uh, become an expatriate, to go and travel abroad, you know, to, if you do an MBA, to take uh, international MBAs uh, or executive MBAs where you visit other cultures, where you visit other universities. So for me, again, it is important to do it also physically and not only virtually. Now I will change my questions from your career to your experience in the luxury industry. How do you see China as a market for luxury products? And you see that is a trend that is growing or perhaps will it stop? I think that China by definition will go. Uh, and uh, the uh, needs, the taste are becoming every day more sophisticated. I, think I believe that uh, you know, the Chinese market is requesting to have, yes, products coming from abroad, but that they, and we go back to what we said before, that they respect and that they feel the local uh, requests, the local tastes, the local habits. And I think that, uh, and as I see, the organizations as of today are really uh, adapting themselves and making sure that uh, they take this uh, very much into account and making sure that they have, yes, probably, let's take the example of an Italian product, product but that is built uh, and even before building, thought and developed for the Chinese market. And I think this uh, is a major step forward. Chinese people are becoming, and the market is much more demanding with what they expect in terms of customer experience, in terms of top point, in terms of quality. This is very, very important, I believe. And I think there is still much more to be learned uh, than what uh, we believe we have as of today. How uh, digital is impacting uh, the luxury market? Uh, if you take the example of cars, uh, I do believe that people are for sure searching on the web. They know everything about uh, the vehicle, the motorcycle, or the goods that they want to buy. But at a certain moment in time, when you buy something that uh, has a soul, because uh, Italian cars have a soul, you need to have this moment of truth where you go to the dealer, where you touch the car, you know, you look at the shape, you touch the leather, you look at the stitches. You, you, you look at the combination of things and you see it in, in real. No, and this is something very important. But uh, I, I make again uh, the, dis the, the distinction between whether it is something that you buy as it is, as you saw it, or if it is something that you can uh, um, customize, that you can make it more personal. In terms of tools, well, you know, the digital platform, the e-commerce platforms today, 
are amazing because uh, you know you can almost interact uh, you know with the brand you can interact with people you can talk to people you really get to a point where uh, you know you you could almost touch you know and luckily this touch is not yet there you no know? and, and i believe that uh, you have to understand that if you have a product that at a certain moment in time you need to touch because you need to feel how good this product is uh, there is this moment of truth where you need to visit uh, and you need to have this face to face interaction but and going back to what we did uh, for example uh, in china you know as you do remember for Alfa Romeo or for Maserati we did sell online Maserati but then there was the moment when the car uh, was delivered and uh, you also need to consider that, that you need to be uh, looking after there is another moment during which you need to talk to um, to, to the sales rep for example so this is uh, this is how i see then there is the point of speed how fast you want to go uh, because uh, if you are very very much sure about what you want then uh, you have already seen it because uh, your friend uh, had it because uh, it is something that you have been searching for for a number of days weeks months well it is much faster probably to use the uh, the, the e-commerce platforms I, i remember now you mentioned the maserati that when we have our conversation i told you can we expect to see an autonomous maserati and you said what never can you explain why <laughs> Let's assume that uh, the technology will bring us there, and you will have an autonomous uh, Maserati or Alfa Romeo. Okay, who bought the Maserati, the Alfa Romeo, will decide that he wants to drive the car himself. So, what I really hope is that there will always be given okay, the choice to the owner to yes, maybe to be driven in the car. But also to drive it. I do hope uh, that uh, many of the beautiful things that we have been used to do, and that driving is uh, an experience, is something that gives you a lot. It's something you know when you drive or you turn on a Maserati or an Alfa Romeo, you smile. When you go from A to B, I always made this example. You know, you have a great experience. And if you had a bad day at work, but you know that in your car park you have a Maserati or an Alfa, and you can drive your 10 miles. You know, to go back at home, uh, that you know, that period, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it will be, that, that specific drive will give you, you know, a better mood than what you had after a long, uh, uh, tiring and difficult day. So luxury goods must give you something that will make you feel better. And better. it doesn't have to be just uh, an object, because if not, they lose, uh, they lose soul. My next question is about uh, your studies. You study uh, uh, at Bocconi in Milan, who is actually one of the exchange schools at uh, CIBS. What advice can you give to MBA graduates who are looking to forge a career in the luxury sector? I tell you my takeaway from my MBA okay. and from my studies at Bocconi. They were very simple. First of all, you need to have a very open mind. You need to be multicultural, and this goes back to what we said before. You need to have this mindset and willingness to challenge yourself. You know, because uh, if you are multicultural, and as, as, as we said before, you need to discover a new culture. Well, it's not going to be a walk in the park like when you deal with your own culture. But what an MBA teaches you is to see challenges from a different angle, uh, and then you can immediately apply this to your business. You know, and this is the other beauty. You no, know, it's not. Uh, you think that you're studying a lot. There is a lot of theory. No, but you can put this this theory in practice very quickly. Luxury wise, again, it, it, it goes back to this point. Uh, whether it is uh, luxury goods or it is heavy duty equipment or it is cars, trucks, you simply need to have uh, a humble approach in understanding the market need. The other thing that I say, if uh, you uh, are really in love with uh, luxury, with fashion, with cars, with, with, with everything that is luxury driven. I think uh, you need to pursue this passion and you need to go after, you need to send out application, you need to work uh, with your networking for making sure that people will take in consideration not only your uh, ability to do things, because by definition, if you did uh, such, uh, you know, such a course and you've been uh, 
uh, and you graduated from, uh, you know, serious, you are by definition very good. Okay? It, this is it's not a question of competencies. It is now a question of the ability to execute. And the execution is the most difficult thing to do. Because you have an idea, you need to understand how to develop this idea and to put it into practice. And then there is the execution. And then there is, again, another moment of truth in business that is the number. How much this idea, this execution brought to the company. Because you will always be judged on numbers. Whether you do finance, whether you do sales, whether you do marketing, you will be measured. Well, I have an announcement for you. Our MBA, CIBS MBA, has three sections. And uh, just that we opened the program. And one of the sections is very close to you. One section started in Zurich. So now MBA, uh, CIBS MBA is a, uh, really a truly global program, yeah? Um, I mean, you are one of the best uh, business school in the world, so uh, no doubt that uh, wherever you go, you will be great. So, uh, that's again uh, something that uh, people will look at. If you are if you look at a business school, you look how international this business school is. And diversity is, is critical for us, yeah? Um, my last question for you, if you talk to a, 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 a young European professional, consider it China and an MBA, what, what do you think that uh, the China experience would add to his future career? A tremendous boost. Basic uh, piece of advice would be, if, you are, if you're given such an opportunity, take it, go there, you know, and uh, open your ears very much close your mouth a little bit more and said from an Italian, believe me, it was very difficult. And uh, <laughs> I, have, uh, I have still uh, stitches on my body, a very uh, painful exercise, but uh, it is something that uh, makes you become uh, a real businessman or businesswoman. So uh, great, great experience. And uh, if you're given the opportunity, go for it. If you're not given up the opportunity, ask for it. Okay, thank you very much. With this, uh, I finish the interview. I appreciate the time. And I hope that uh, we can see you back in China one time. Yeah? Great thank pleasure you. to be with you. And thank you for everything you did uh, for us uh, with the support uh, uh, in, uh, in doing business. Really, really important for an organization like uh, ours in Vienna. Thank you. Thank you.